The first thing that, that I always mention to people is that Sharia already has a great impact on American law and people don't even know it. The founding documents of this country refer to concepts that are completely Muslim in origin, that have nothing to do with the continental or uh, Roman uh, uh, civil law. So in Europe, in the mainland of Europe, there is a, a, a kind of a common legal code and common body of precedence that Europeans base their law off of. It's called civil law. Civil law is basically what uh, uh, the different countries of Europe inherited from uh, Roman law after the breakup of the Roman Empire. So you see that the legal traditions of France, of uh, places like uh, uh, Germany, places like Italy, of these types of places, their, their laws are based on, 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 on European civil law and there's quite a bit of similarity uh, between them. England, however, doesn't run on civil law. England runs on something they call common law. For those of you who understand common law, common law is, a, again, like civil law, is a similar and, and, and a shared set of legal practices, traditions, and precedents that are shared between the people of the mainland of Europe. England has a, a completely separate system, and the American system is based on the back of what? Of common law. So for example, in America, if a person, if a man and a woman live together for seven years in the state of Washington, I don't know what the law is in the state of Wisconsin or in Illinois, but in the state of Washington, if a man and a woman live together for seven years or more, the, the, the state will consider them to have been married even if they never got a marriage certificate or a marriage license, and they will refer to it as what? As a common law marriage. As a common law marriage. Meaning that, based on this kind of set of precedents and traditions, legal traditions, that we refer to as the common law, whatever they have agreement or arrangement they have, they must have some arrangement because they've been in it for seven years. It's a common law marriage. So my, you know, by the way, if there are like lawyers in, in the, in the present in the audience or live streaming at home or someone watching it later on, you say, oh my God, this guy's butchering our, uh, this guy's butchering our field and like, it's more complicated than that, right? A, welcome to my world when I have to sit through a, a doctor and engineer giving Juma Khutbah. And secondly, uh, uh, um, secondly, inshallah, of course, you have to simplify because there's a limited amount of time, inshallah. Uh, you know, we'd love to uh, benefit from the uh, expertise of experts in every field. So, by all means, inshallah, share your expertise, inshallah, maybe through the comments in the YouTube video or through writing a letter to myself or to Ilm Oasis, and we'll, inshallah, uh, benefit from whatever you have to say and spread that benefit as well. But a person is married, common law marriage, right? So, common law is this. It's a thing that we, we refer to, right? That if there is all other things being equal, there are certain sets of precedents that are, 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 are universally accepted through uh, uh, English law and then in some fashion American law as well. What's the difference between common law and civil law? Why is it that England has a different uh, 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 body of precedents and traditions, legally speaking, than the uh, European continent. Is it that England was never ruled by the uh, Roman Empire? No, in fact, England was ruled by the Roman Empire for uh, uh, several centuries. Uh, and then the Romans retreated and left it. And then afterward, uh, uh, it will be, uh, uh, quote unquote, civilized again uh, by a different people, by, by the Normans, uh, at least according to popular uh, narrative in England. Obviously, Anglo-Saxons may have something to uh, disagree with about that, but at any rate, uh, the difference between common law and civil law is, I mean, there are many differences, but one of the main differences is based on what? Based on the fact that the modern monarchy of England is from where? Does anyone know? It's not a Jummah Khutbah, you can raise your hand. Impress your family members and whatnot. Anyone know? Where, where, where does the, like, the modern lineage of kings uh, and queens in England start from? Anyone? No one? Mufti, Mufti Nana, even you? Right? The, do you guys know anything? That Battle of Hastings, right? Normandy. There's a place in France called Normandy. There's a place in France called Normandy, right? Norman means north, a person from the north, right? So the Vikings rule over um, uh, the, the coast of, of Europe and over England for several centuries. And so Normandy is one of their colonies that's left over there. And the, the, the William of Normandy, who they refer to as William the Conqueror, he's a Duke of Normandy, because he's a Viking and the King of uh, England is a, a Viking, Edward the Confessor, so they're relatives. And so when Edward the Confessor dies, 
Uh, William the Conqueror says that my cousin, he left me the, the throne of England after he died. And so he comes with an army. Obviously, the, uh, uh, you know, Harold, who is uh, 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 one of his other uh, uh, relatives, he disagrees. They have a huge battle. Uh, William the Conqueror, as the name suggests, beats Harold in battle and he thro uh, you know, makes himself king. After which they will totally mess up everything that happens in England, according to the Anglo-Saxons. How will they mess it up? they will now bring French and French influence into England because they're French-speaking people. So for, for several generations, the kings, of, uh, of the kings and monarchs of England will be born in France and French will be their native language. Centuries will pass before English is the native language of any English monarch. The second thing is what? They will bring uh, uh, the traditions of the Normans, which we'll speak about, right? The third thing is what will happen is that they will now try to integrate the Anglo-Saxon law and the continental law, they'll try to integrate it together. So who are the Normans? This is like a huge family, uh, a huge uh, 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 aristocratic class, if you will. And they have empire, they have states all over the place, right? So one of their states is where? It's in all places, Sicily. Sicily, in Arabic, Saqilia, right? It's the island of Sicily, it's right off of the toe of the boot of England, if you will. And many of you probably know people of Sicilian descent, right? I live in Chicago currently, and uh, despite having lived there for two years, I still don't have any uh, affinity or affection for the Bears, so go figure. Uh, but uh, 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 the, 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 the island of Sicily was actually ruled by the Muslims for centuries, and people don't know that. People oftentimes will refer to Muslim uh, 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 rule in, in, in in Europe by talking about Andalusia, by talking about Spain. But actually, economically, the lands in Sicily were more prosperous and more productive. And for those uh, a couple of centuries that the Muslims ruled over Sicily, they had a, 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 a absolute renaissance. It was something that was really beautiful uh, in terms of uh, uh, not only uh, economic uh, benefit, but also intellectual benefit. Did you know that the first substantive commentary on Sahih Muslim was written by a Maliki Sheikh by the name of Imam al-Mazari? Mazari is a muhaqqiq of the Maliki Madhab, he's a Sicilian. Lakhmi is a muhaqqiq of the Maliki Madhab, he is a Sicilian. Uh, 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 Allah Masala Sayyidina Muhammad. Uh, Al-Idrisi, who is an alim, uh, who also is a cartographer, he's the first person that builds, or who will be able to write somewhat of a reasonable map of the world. He's a Sicilian. He's a Sicilian, people don't understand that. Uh, As'ad ibn Furat, who is a student both of Imam Malik, a direct student both of Imam Malik and of uh, Imam Muhammad, Imam Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani, right? Who is a direct student. So only one uh, link between him and Imam Abu Hanifa, right? He's buried in Sicily. He's buried outside the gates of Syracuse. He came as a mujahid fi sabilillah. And uh, 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 the Muslims actually came to Sicily and the reason that they were so successful over there, or one of the many reasons they were so successful over there is they overthrew the feudal system and actually let the peasant commoners own the land that they worked. Therefore giving them incentive, right, for our Republican friends, giving them incentive to what? Work harder because they're going to earn the money from their increased uh, production. And it absolutely blew all of the uh, uh, land production uh, um, uh, 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 statistics off the chart based uh, when compared against the uh, uh, productivity of, of agricultural land on mainland Europe because people in mainland Europe commoners were held as serfs basically uh, as slaves uh, of the noble class and so what happens is what is that that this rule in Muslim Sicily was ended by a Norman knight a Norman knight who is commissioned by the Pope to kick the infidels the Muslims to kick the infidels out of Sicily and so there is a Norman king by the name of Roger who will take a Norman army uh, and they will uh, sail onto Sicily and they will fight the Muslims in battle in several different places and they will militarily overwhelm them and they will end the Muslim rule over Sicily. But Roger is an interesting person. Roger, what does he do? He's not like the uh, uh, he's not like the Spanish kings of of of, of uh, Castilla, of Castile and Leon and of Aragon. He's not like them, in the sense that he has some sort of blind and bigoted hatred against the Muslims. He's only doing this uh, out of some maybe lukewarm religious conviction, probably more for uh, economic and political gain. So when he becomes the king of Sicily, what does he do? He'll learn Arabic. 
He will read the books of, uh, uh, of the Muslims. He will uh, read the Quran. He will read the Hadith of the Prophet He will learn the Sharia ah in a way perhaps uh, uh, nobody in this room uh, will ever have the tawfiq of doing. They say that he used to know Arabic so well that he used to compose his own poetry in the Arabic language. We barely know how to even read poetry that's written in front of us properly. He used to compose his own poetry in the Arabic language and he was so impressed with the civilization that the Muslims built in Sicily. Not only did he give a, an amnesty that the Muslims can live and practice as they wish to, he hired many of the Muslims that were functionaries in the Sicilian government to work for him, giving him also the benefits that the mainland Europe was missing out on. And he also adopted and incorporated certain rules of the Sharia, ah, especially regarding the way debts are treated and the way certain sales are, uh, are affected. Um, because the Muslims have this ability to trade, right, from, from classical times uh, over a large uh, expanse of, of geographical land. So a check that's written in Baghdad can be good in Morocco or it's good in, uh, uh, in Indonesia, which is not even the case in the modern economic system, much less in classical times where they lack the technology uh, to affect such transactions because it all ran on trust. But he, he liked this, these systems of hawalas, of transferring debts and of, of, of buying and trading and solving certain issues of liquidity. And the Normans had a huge uh, empire. So you imagine this, right? So somebody is ruling in Normandy and France. Somebody is in England. Somebody is going to go on the Crusades and go this way. Somebody is going to go that way. And they're all one empire and they have to affect all of this trade. So they learn a lot of these things from the Muslims and they adopt these things into their own law. And that's w one of the key points where uh, English common law and what will become English common law diverges from what? From the continental civil law. So they referred to him as the baptized sultan, that this is the baptized sultan, that, that the Pope always wondered this guy, is he really a Christian or not? Maybe he's like undercover Muslim and he's not telling us because he's promoting these, so he'll do like amazing things, like he'll build monasteries and churches that look like masajid and they're filled with Arabic calligraphy on all the walls and things like that. So the other Christians are like, hmm, this guy, you know, keep an eye on him because he may try something funny on us, but uh, Allahu Alam, he lived and died as a Christian, but he, he appreciated Muslim civilization and incorporated parts of it into Western civilization. One of the most important elements of Muslim law that they take uh, for uh, uh, right, an Islamic judge, and there's a need for a qadi everywhere Muslims live. Classically, uh, many of the ulama, including Imam Malik, they considered it to be haram for a Muslim to live as a minority in a non-Muslim country. They classically considered that to be wajib for such a person to make hijrah and go back to the Muslim world. As time went on, this theoretical precept was challenged by issues like having a large, again in Sicily, having a large, uh, untransplantably large Muslim population that now because of the recon reconquest of Sicily by the uh, Europeans, it's impossible to transplant them back to, the, um, uh, to Africa. Or like the reconquista that happens in, uh, 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 in Spain, it's impossible to transplant all those people back into Morocco, into Tunisia, into Algeria. And so the Maliki Fuqaha will later on recognize that this is an ideal perhaps we're not going to be able to live up to, so we have to learn to deal with it. So one of the things that the Maliki Fuqaha said, and the Muslims always need a Qadi, they always need a judge, right? And this is one of the things we should think about also. It's something that I teach in my classes as well, that in America we don't have an Islamic court that we've set up. When I say Islamic court, I'm not talking about taking over the federal building downtown. I'm saying at least for our civil matters and our personal matters and our disputes between one another, a dispute between husband and wife and all of these things, we don't have something like this set up. This is one of the, one of the long laundry lists of things that the uh, uh, Muslim community needs to get around to. And in order to do that, you need to train people who are technically proficient, not somebody who can give a moving talk in front of uh, you know, a bunch of people that will make them cry and make them make toba or something very uh, entertaining or something that will you know, maybe be more appropriate for an Isna convention or whatnot. We need people who are technically proficient in the law. Right? Ulama who are technically proficient in the law in order to be able to affect those things. So they have a, a need for a judge to make a, a ruling on a certain thing and you don't have one faqih, one person who is qualified to be the qadi in such a case. Which is probably an apt description of where most of the uh, Muslim communities, the situation that most of the Muslim communities in America fall. So what do they say? They say in the absence of anyone who's a faqih, somebody who's uh, technically proficient in the law, you can point, appoint a council of 40 a 40 people, which is according to uh, 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 you know, a very popular opinion, what they refer to as al-jam al-ghafir, 
right? A group of people that if they're upright people and they practice their deen and they're God-fearing people and they're people who do what Allah has made farbal on them and stay abstain from the haram, etc., etc., that that number of people is enough that if they come together and they make dua and they're sincere to Allah Ta'ala, they make dua that Allah Ta'ala show them what's right, Allah Ta'ala won't send them astray. That those 40 people can make decisions on behalf of a judge that's technically proficient in the law and their verdict will take the place of the verdict of that judge uh, under the principle of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu The thing that cannot be completely uh, attained also shouldn't be left completely either. So this council of 40 people that will stand in the place of a judge is then adopted by whom? It's adopted by the Normans into civil law. That's how you receive the concept of trial by jury, something that is originally absent, for, sorry, into common law. That's how you receive the concept of trial by jury, something that's totally absent from continental civil law. So if you have a problem with Sharia, go amend the constitution and throw out trial by jury. Go throughout the laws you have regarding the protection of debtors and bankruptcy. Go throughout all of these things, which it's very easily demonstrable that these are, uh, uh, these are concepts that are not natively developed by Europeans or by Englishmen or by Americans or by the Normans. Rather, they are very demonstrably pulled from, uh, 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 from Islamic law and adopted into a European law uh, because a wise man will uh, take wisdom from wherever it comes. A wise man will take wisdom from wherever it comes. And if you want to kind of call my bluff on this one, you think that this guy, mashallah, you know, whenever you listen to a Muslim talk, all of a sudden Muslims discovered America, Muslims invented the airplane, Muslims in, you know, were the first ones to the moon. And there's some people like that. So you know, if you're wary about it, I, 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 I can understand where you're coming from because I've heard a lot of those kind of nonsense talks also myself. There's a, 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 a Christian uh, 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 Lebanese scholar, uh, actually not Lebanese, I should say there's a Christian Palestinian scholar, his name is George Maqdisi. I don't know if he's even alive anymore or not. George is spelled George and Maqdisi is spelled with a K, not with a Q, right? M-A-K-D-I-S-I. -S George Maqdisi, he wrote two articles. One about the, uh, 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 the way that the madrasa system, the, the system of schools to uh, teach the sharia in the Muslim world, will be the seed that will give you the, the current form and shape of universities in the West. And the other is called Islam and, uh, I believe Islam and the rise of colleges. I'm not 100% sure. And the other one is called Islam and the rise of humanism. And it talks about how the very concept of the humanities comes through uh, the Muslim world, is transmitted to Europe through the Muslim world. And he wrote a paper about Islam and the origins of common law. The paper you can find, I think, for free on the internet. I don't know if it's like legally for free, but I see that there are places that you can find it for free on the internet. You can read it on your own, come to your own conclusions, inshallah. But it's written by a non-Muslim, an academia, and somebody who has a PhD and all of these other things. So if you, you know, think that this is just some you know, beard, bearded guy who's trying to give, give us an Islam-invented-everything speech again, well, you, know, you can go look it up and, and, and see for yourself. So what did we say? We already proved Islam is not trying to kill nobody. We already, proved, you know, we already understand through common sense that Islam, even if it wanted to have complete hegemony over America, it couldn't do so except for through the democratic process. And now we're already proving that the Sharia actually is a, uh, I would argue, an inseparable part of what makes American law American law. I mean, forget about trial by jury. These are furu'i issues. These are ancillary issues. Let's talk about usuli issues, fundamental issues. What does Thomas Jefferson, the eloquent man who drafted the uh, Declaration of Independence, what does he uh, talk about? He talks about life, liberty, and the pr pursuit of happiness. The very concept that there are kulliyat, that there are, are, are certain things that the law is there to defend, and there are certain things that the law is there to protect, that form the social contract between the ruler and between the subjects that they rule, is something that you will not find any origin with, in Christianity or in the West or in Roman law. You won't find that concept anywhere in the West or in Christianity, but you'll find it centuries before uh, Thomas Jefferson. John Locke will write, before Thomas Jefferson, he'll write about life, uh, 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 liberty, and property. Life, liberty, and property. And even centuries before John Locke will write, people like Imam Ghazali and people like the Usuli theorists of the Sharia will talk about al kulliyat al khams that there are five things that the Sharia, every law of the Sharia is there to protect one of these five things. And there's no law that is there except for it gives you benefit in one of these five things. The first is what? Deen. 
The second is, and we'll get to that, put an asterisk by Dean. Why did, why did Thomas Jefferson and John Locke not, not uh, uh, mention Dean? The second is what? It's life. The third is what? A person's mal, their property. The, the f- fourth is what? A person's ird, their, their honor. Their honor. And that's not there either. That's not there either. Because, uh, uh, and what does it tell you about a civilization? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Hajjatul Wida'ah, he said, he said what? He asked the people, what is this, what is this uh, 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 day? And they said, Allah and His Rasul know best. And he fell silent, so silent that they thought when he said something, he's going to name it a different name than the name that, that, that they knew for it. And he said, isn't this the day of, isn't this the day of Arafah? And they said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. And then he asked, what month is this? And they say, Allah and His Rasul know best, right? No, it's Zulhijjah, I know. No, right? it's Adab, right? So, uh, because they trusted the Prophet ﷺ, and people used to trust the ulama at one time as well. Well, iyadu billah, now that there are people that, 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 you know, they don't trust the ulama anymore, and you see that the ummah is in the state that it's in. He's asked, what month is it? He said, Allah, they said, Allah and His Rasul know best, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he fell silent so, silent so long that they thought he'll name it from a name that it's, uh, from a different name that, that they knew. And he asked, isn't this the month of Dhul Hijjah? And they said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. And then he asked, asked them, what uh, uh, land is this? And they said, Allah and His Rasul know best, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he fell silent so silent, they thought he would name the land by a name other than its name. And he says, isn't this the Baladullah al-Haram, the, 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 the sacred land of Allah Ta'ala? And they said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. And then he says something very, it's very simple. You want to explain to someone what Sharia is? It's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, then know that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has made your lives sacred. And He's made your property sacred. And He's made your honor sacred. Just like Allah Ta'ala made this day sacred and this month sacred and this land sacred. Right? So what does it tell you about one civilization that talks about the honor of a people being one of the kulliyat, one of those things that every law of the Sharia returns to? And what does it tell you about another people that don't include a person's honor in, in those kulliyat? But at any rate, there's honor, and then the, what's the fifth one? Nasab. That a person has a right to their nasab. This is one of the reasons why it's haram for a person to marry their sister, or haram for a person to commit zina, right? Nowadays, they have these kind of issues, okay? Uh, you know, that if nobody's, you know, if everyone's happy and nobody's hurting and nobody's like, you know, being abused or whatever, then why should the government care? Why should the government care? So if a man wants to marry his sister, why should the government care? Your Judeo-Christian values or your, uh, you know, Muslimic values, you know, don't, uh, don't accept it. Well, I have a different set of values and we have freedom of, you know, and whatever. So why is it, why is it, why is it, ha- ha- really to be honest with you, Western law has no, uh, uh, good answer for this question. They have no good answer for this question. This happened in France uh, not too long ago that there were a, a, a man and a woman, both were adopted. And they were, they were adopted and they fell in love, they get married, they have two, three kids and then they realize through some DNA testing or something like that, man, these two are brothers and sisters, I don't know, DNA testing or something or another. They realize that they're actually brother and sister. They're actually brother and sister and they were adopted, one was adopted by one family and one was adopted by another family. They, they never knew. So what happens is the, the, you know, some magistrate in the government sent them some paperwork after they found out saying, you guys have to break it up because, uh, uh, you know, you're brother and sister and that's uh, unlawful in the law of the land. And they said, no, we love each other. And what happened? The French public had such an outcry, such a backlash, they amended the law in order to allow these people to live together. Now the children... The children, who's your mother, who's your khala, who's your uh, mamu, who's your, who's anybody, who knows, Allah, Allah knows best. The entire family tree, the nasab is confused, it's messed up, right? That's why, right? That's why, that's the reason we give that nasab, a person, the preservation of their lineage that everyone should know who their father is and know who their mother is. And that their, 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 their lineage, knowing what their lineage is properly, is a essential ingredient to them, functioning as a, uh, as a productive human being in society. Uh, this, is, this is what Islam has to offer that the West doesn't have from before. So if you have a problem with one of these five things, it's very important. You understand this is very important. What's my proof that African American people out of all people need to understand why the nasab is important. Why is it that you have African American people in America, someone's last name Jenkins, someone's last name Jones, someone's last name is whatever, uh, uh, you know, this, that, or the other thing. That's not your forefather's last name. Why? Because they stole your forefathers' last names from you. They stole the names of your people, the name of your tribe, the names of your fathers, and the names of your mothers from you. 
because they knew if a person doesn't know who they are, it's easier to uh, convince that person that they're not a human being. If they don't know what their nasab is, they don't know where they belong in the family tree of mankind. It's, it's, it's very interesting and I've, I kind of get a little irritated nowadays because oftentimes there's a beautiful tradition when people would become Muslims, they would take a Muslim name. And now somehow, I don't know if for some reason or another, this has become like uh, not fashionable anymore. And obviously it's not far for a person to take a new name unless their old name has something wrong with it or something bad about it. But there's beauty in taking a name in Islam. And especially, I don't understand, especially African American brothers and sisters, when people tell them this, obviously, most of them, they, they say, hey, listen, that's not my name in the first place. That's the name of somebody who illegally and irresponsibly enslaved my forefathers. And uh, uh, why should I carry that person's name with me at all? It's better, right? That's what Malcolm X, why did he become X? He says, better to uh, use X because it's an unknown quantity then to attribute myself to uh, the name of the person who did Vulma on my forefathers. It's absolutely important that people know what their nasab is, who they are, where they're from. And if they cannot know that, at least to know where, where they're not from. That's important as well. So these are the five things that the Sharia calls to. If you have a problem with one of these five things, then go ahead and, and, and uh, uh, you know, kick up the dust with Fox News and whatnot. If you think that these five things are reasonable, then you should at least understand. You don't have to accept, but you should at least understand what the benefit is in the Sharia. With this, inshallah, I think it's a good break point. We've gone on long with the discussion. I've gone on uh, longer than I wanted to. Uh, uh, I just wanted to give two things in summary. If someone ever has a problem with the Sharia, I say, I have a book of Sharia, let me show it to you. You can pull out the, uh, any uh, translation of any fiqh book and you'll see that it, the first thing is it, it shows you is what's clean and what's not clean and then it shows you how to wash yourself after going to the bathroom. Then it shows you how to uh, you know, make ghusl after having relations. This, this is not something that's going to overthrow the... Uh, the throne from underneath the, you know, from an underneath Obama. It's not going to throw the over Oval Office over his head. It's don't worry. It's nothing that you need to be afraid of. There are certain people who profit from your fear, uh, and you and I are not one of them. So you don't need to worry about that. So that's a very easy thing you can say.